Oceans covers 71% of Earth, stretching deep enough to engulf Mount Everest and still have enough room for eight Titanics laid end to end. Throughout the vast majority of human history, very nearly all bodies of water have been off limits. Ships that sink were considered lost forever. Voyages across vast stretches seemed nonsensical. And what lay below the waves was relegated to the imaginations of those that existed on the surface. But as time went on, a daring few set out to see what else was out there, to push the boundaries of just how deep mankind could go, especially as rumors of untold riches began to surface about what might be waiting under the sea. But they had no idea just how dangerous this feat would become. This is the story of the diving bell, and this is learn something new. In the earliest parts of human history, large bodies of water were meant to be traveled atop, sailing, floating, or swimming across the surface. The unfathomable depths that lie below, unable to be explored beyond humanity's lung capacity. But the draw of the unknown has always enticed people throughout history to push themselves further than anyone ever before, seeking ways to expand our grasp on the world around us. As far back as the 4th century BC, legend passed down in fragments of art on pottery and in the writings of Aristotle claimed that Alexander the Great made a fine barrel entirely of white glass that trapped air, allowing people to reach the deepest depths humanity had ever seen, going on to use it in the Siege of Tyre in 332 BC. Prior to this, a fascination with water had persisted. From ancient Egypt to Rome and Greece, people had been using hollowed out reeds as snorkels to keep their heads underwater while they continued to breathe fresh air, but it still kept them tethered to the surface. The device that Alexander the Great allegedly had built in the story would have been the first diving bell, though whether or not it was actually created is up for interpretation as there were tendencies for Alexander the Great's adventures to reach mythological status. But the diving bell itself wouldn't remain a myth forever, especially as a greater motivation emerged for staying beneath the waves for extended periods of time. Between the years of 1500 and 1650, reports of diving bells became much more reliable. Prior to this point, they had taken the form of things like barrels or other large containers that could be placed over a diver's head while they sink down to the depths, usually for short stints to gather pearls farther offshore. In 1535, however, Italian inventor Guglielmo de Lorena created and tested his own form of diving bell to explore a lake that had been said to have had sunken ships near Rome. As more and more ships carrying valuable items were rumored to be sinking around Europe, whether they were lost in wars like Henry VIII's naval ships, or like the Santa Margarita sunk in a hurricane in 1622, more divers began taking a chance on attempting to loot what they could. With inventors seeing the technology as a business rather than a novelty, improvements began to come more quickly and it began to be used more widely, and there were some very influential people interested in the technology. The scientist Edmund Haley, who was credited with discovering Haley's Comet, filed his own patent for a diving bell which initially had cables that could transport small chambers of additional air to be piped into a bigger bell, but later would develop air pipes that led directly to the surface to ensure a supply of fresh air inside the bell continuously. Though in foreshadowing a problem that would begin to plague the divers for hundreds of years after, Haley claimed after spending an hour in his creation at 60 feet below the surface that his ears felt as if a quill had been thrust into them. And on the diver's side, Sir William Phipps, a man who would become famous for his role as the Massachusetts Bay Colony governor who presided over the Salem witch trials, spent a fair amount of time collecting valuables that nobody else could reach, working with divers to collect a sizable chunk of treasure from a sunken Spanish galleon off the coast of modern day Haiti, salvaging around 30 tons of silver as well as some gold and jewels for the King of England James II, who had not invested any money into the venture, but claimed its proceeds for the royal family anyway, letting Phipps keep just over 6% of the haul, enough to make him a very wealthy man regardless. But diving was far from an easy prospect. The early forms of the diving bell were dangerous, and even when used properly, the risk of drowning was exceptionally high. And this was something that Charles Spaulding tried to change, adding weights to Haley's design in order to balance the device, not to mention the pulley system that gave the diver further control over the bell and even added windows. Spaulding and his nephew used these safer diving bells for salvage work off the coast of Ireland until they both suffocated inside one on one fateful dive. 
Even with the added safety measures, this was exceptionally dangerous work, and its use was only being expanded. As the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s began to set in, larger infrastructure projects also entered the scene. Some of these, from the construction of the Eads Bridge, to the restoration of England's Hexham Bridge, to the construction of the New York City's Brooklyn Bridge, meant that laborers would have to go underwater in caissons that would allow them to work below the surface, where water had been pumped out of. Once these workers made their way back to the surface at the end of their shift, however, they would begin to experience symptoms of what became known as Kyson sickness. You see, the workers inside these Kysons inhaled air at the depth they worked at, which had a higher ambient pressure under the water. The pressurized gases then dissolved in their blood, and upon returning to the surface, the gases that had been absorbed, which was mostly nitrogen, rapidly expanded, forming bubbles that got lodged into joints, the nervous system, and other parts of the body they really shouldn't be, wrecking havoc on the divers. When these laborers came to the surface, they experienced such intense pain throughout their bodies, doubling over in pain as their joints filled with the bubbles. Colleagues would often tease those affected, comparing their walk to the bent fashion that affluent women walked with at the time, known as the Grecan Bend. This nickname stuck, and today, the condition formerly known as decompression sickness is still nicknamed the Bends. It wouldn't be until 1878 that a man named Paul Burt linked the formation of nitrogen bubbles in the body to decompression sickness, suggesting that slower ascents from the depths would help safely eliminate the nitrogen from the body. This observation came far too late for many, however, as during the construction of the Eads Bridge, a reported 15 workers died from the bends. In the Brooklyn Bridge, construction workers reported experiencing muscular paralysis, slurred speech, and excruciating joint pains upon returning to the surface. One of these workers passed away from decompression sickness in his home just two days after beginning work on the project, and two more would be quick to follow. Even the civil engineer in charge of the Brooklyn Bridge's construction, who spent many hours monitoring progress below the surface, suffered from the bends, eventually becoming bedridden from crippling joint pain. Even in conquering the lack of oxygen that prevented explorers from venturing more than a few dozen feet below the surface at any given point, didn't prevent the danger that Earth's bodies of waters posed to any who dared try to exert their will over Mother Nature, taking back treasures that had long since been swallowed and attempting to create works of architecture and engineering never before seen. The history of the diving bell was just the beginning of mankind attempting to explore the deepest points of the planet. Despite the progress that was made over hundreds, perhaps even over a thousand years, they had only scratched the surface of how far they could really go. It's not hard to understand why early maps were often detailed with pictures of sea monsters in a domain beneath the waves, only allowing sailors to pass if they willed it. The vast span of the oceans with depths that seemingly had no end left a gap in our understanding of the world that allowed any number of imaginary creations to fill its place. But there's a select few that pushed aside that fear, and ventured over the seas to see what else was out there, and an arguably more bold group of individuals willing to push into the realm of the unknown for themselves, pushing mankind's understanding deeper as they went. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, feel free to like, subscribe, and share, as it really helps support the channel. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.